had just got to uh, we talked about going to in the Papoose to we met the Mormons because I remember saying the young gay Mormons and right so, you moved into there you got your color wheel got my color wheel um, you started doing your shows for the strippers yeah choreographing okay, the cool. shows of course um, yeah, and then um, doing my routines. <laughs> right now, at the same time, like you were supposed to be in school, right? Yes. And so, what were you actually learning? What was I learning? I was learning how to um, can peaches. Uh huh. And I learned how to make salsa. Okay. <laughs> That's a great. And story. I can't make either one of those now. Oh, and I also learned to sew, which I can't even sew a button on now. Huh. Basically, the best thing I learned how to do is what I was teaching, which was the dancing. Mm. Do you like canned peaches now? Do I what? Do you like canned peaches now? I I don't care one way or the other. Oh, okay. I'll eat them, but, you know. Gotcha. I don't love them. I just remember canning, like, they, there was always a lot of canning going on in the kitchens. I was like, Ugh. Yeah. You know? We're not eating this now, then why do we have to eat it at the end of the world, you know? Right. I figured if the world is ending, then God could at the very least bring us some ambrosia salad, right? Something. Something. Something, something, something. <laughs> okay, so um, what were your days like? Okay, so I would wake up and I would, uh, I would have a schedule. I, you know, I had to wake up at a certain time and my schedule was, the first thing I had to do is make sure that I looked exactly the way that I needed to be presented. I had to, you know, go and, and pray over what I needed to wear, which was, you know, the peach dress or the peach dress, <laughs> you know, like which one. Um, so I went with the peach dress and mm -hmm. I would wear the same color every day. Uh, I would have to do my makeup a certain way, but the, every single thing had been prayed over, like even the colors for my makeup and, and anything, which by you the way- You were allowed to wear makeup? Yeah, at that young of an age, I should not have been wearing makeup. That was another one of the things that I loved because I mean, we wore it in the house. We wouldn't go out into public wearing it, but we were able to, like, make ourselves up, like, little mm -hmm. women, basically. You know, um, I would, like, do hair for some of the younger girls and then go and do, you know, we're going to do some exercises. We're going to go to the fabric store. We're going to go, you know, just errands. If it was errands, it would be with, like, two or three of the women at the same time. And mm -hmm. Yeah, it was not, it wasn't fun. It wasn't like a bunch of fun things, but there were activities. They would always make sure to have like activities. So they would try to like create fun. So I would try to be excited about, okay, it's salsa night. <laughs> you know, like this is going to be so fun. So the, I imagine there wasn't anyone like just depressed and laying on the couch. No, no. Every, everybody there was really happy. It wasn't the kind of a of place where you didn't see any unhappiness around you. It wasn't like everybody's miserable and beaten and abused and raped and horror. And it's like every single thing kind of seemed like a Stepford dream. Imagine like just where everything you look at seems perfect. If you were walking by or, or checking in, you would say to yourself like, wow, these guys really have it together. I mean, the little girls, every single day, we would like braid and curl and do their hair according to whichever hairstyle was, you know, we had a flip book of hairstyles we could choose from. And, you know, just errands, like we would do errands and stuff. Oh, like vacuuming, we would do chores because every day the house had to be exactly perfect. Like when we would get ready, we would have to like, even putting the blow dryer thing away, it had to be in a perfect kind of like the cord had to be perfect. In case God wanted to use the blow dryer, he would want to come to a perfect house. Right. And see So it. how many of you yeah. were living in a house. How many of you were sharing a bathroom? What was that? Oh, there was like, uh, oh, I would say probably probably like five or six or seven person per house. It wasn't overpacked. It was it was pretty nice, but we would get assigned to sleep in different places. It it wasn't like oh here's your room. Hmm. So we never even had our own room. It was like there was you know the upstairs room or the peach room or the you know downstairs room it wasn't like uh anything and it was like scheduled too oh oh i'll be sleeping here tonight okay cool and i would go and no do you have any idea why that was 
Well, well I, where would the prophet sleep? Would he sleep in just one room and everyone else rotated? Or did yeah, he also he did. rotate? He mostly slept in, in the house across the street from where I lived. And he was, yeah, he stayed there pretty much. I mean, he would visit the other homes, but he would mostly just stay, like, right where he was. Um, and then they would go to him. But the bedroom that he had was very uh, feminine, so it wasn't something, like, that he had created his own, like, you know, man cave or anything like that. Right. It was like there's, like, lace curtains and doilies, you know. So <laughs> definitely it was a place decorated by women. <laughs> <laughs> women and, like, it reminds me of kind of, well, like, a grandmother's place, like, where there's, like, lines in the carpet, like, what you would expect of a grandparent and just, like, big picture of Jesus and children on the wall. And it's just kind of just, you know, weird. Um, scripture sayings were on the wall in case you didn't, like, hear them enough. Then you could be reminded of the little things, like going up and down the stairs. There was a thing that said, like, uh, keep sweet and uh, reverently, quietly. <laughs> that was one. Um, I don't know. Uh, children are to be seen and not heard. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah. So nice. Like so how old were you at this point? Like 13, 14? I, well, you know, I mean, it's really confusing when it comes to the ages because I was, you know, I put, I'm putting like my experiences of a couple of different cults all together into like the one because my parents mm -hmm. kind of like hopped around a, a few different ones and then there was a time like they sent me up to Montana in the mountains to one. So like I was in this world kind of like of, of it from like 12, 13, 14, 15 ish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what was the one in Montana? What was that like? Pinesdale clan. Um, that's like the Kingston clan. So they, now was this the, the Mormon family and the prophet that sent you up there or was it your, Adopted parents? It was Helen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Helen is basically, she were kind of like ran uh, what my parents did. They were just like best friends with my parents. And so Helen would say something like, okay, there's a new sect, a new, you know, group up there in Montana. And I wonder what they're doing. And they seem to be very convinced that it's the truth. Maybe we should investigate. That's the words that they would use. Mm. Um, so Helen's girls that are my age, they came... They went up there, and I was wanted to go up there wherever they were. As far as I was concerned, I wasn't cult hopping. I was just, my friends are up there. I want to go there. And I remember even going up in the van ride up to the mountains with a bunch of people. I didn't know anyone. There was a little boy in the van that just kept, like, farting and farting the whole way up there. And I was, it was a nightmare. That's all I remember. Just like, ugh. But How many of you in a van? It was packed. There was barely room for me. Like, I was sitting like this the whole time, all the way up to Montana. And we had a log cabin up there that we lived in that had, like, no windows or doors. And there was, um, there was an outhouse, and I milked goats, and, uh, it was, yeah, it was, like, pretty crazy. And How many people were up there in Montana? There's a whole, um... There, there's a whole society up there. I would, a, a couple thousand even, maybe a thousand or two at least. Wow. There's the whole group that's still there. And what's their belief? It's a break off of the mainstream Mormon church and the, they have their own prophet. And the thing is there's so many prophets that are break offs of the Mormon church because the Mormon church believes that you can get direct messages from God as a man in the priesthood. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, all these men think they're getting messages from God and that they're the prophet. Yeah. So that's how that goes. <laughs> um, yeah. So they believe the basics. Uh, they don't. They don't do the crazy. Um, I didn't experience any of the crazy like uh, abuse towards children or anything like that in Montana. I saw. Mm -hmm. But then they moved me into this house with. The, you know, my girlfriend who went up there too. And now there's a house with this guy named Jack. And Jack was, um, he was pursuing, he was married to Gail, who was my mother's friend, by the way. So they're older people. And so Jack, he told me too, like, I'm going to be a warrior in heaven, a mighty 
a mighty Saint Michael something again with the six pack and all of that. I mean, it's like, did they have a man meeting and say, hey guys, we're all gonna have capes and swords and six packs, okay? Like, they'll believe it. Like, I, I don't know how they came up with this, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna be a mighty warrior and I remember just seeing things that seemed to like be so weird and I was always trying to figure things out because I knew I was being lied to up there. There was like, another girl our age mm -hmm. who came in and she had like hickeys all over her neck one one day and I was like what happened are you okay like I didn't I still wasn't putting together hickeys and any kind of like sexual thing because I wasn't really completely even all there yet in the sexual world I was really young um yeah so she said she was attacked by a bear I later found out she was um you know, attacked by a jack. <laughs> a jack, yeah, his name's Jack. The Mighty Warrior! Oh. Um, she's, from what I've heard, I heard that she had gone mentally ill and that she's in a facility now, mm. that girl. That she had some real issues. As a matter of fact, a lot of the girls that, that I know that have left that group, that I'm still in contact with, the girls that are my age, one of them, she lives in a new group in Manti, Utah. And I'm just like not saying their names on, on purpose, just for their sure. sake. But then uh, Helen's daughters, like one of them had to go through intensive therapy for a really long time. And she's, you know, more disconnected from her family than, and doesn't speak to her mother. And then the other one... Um, she's like, what, Laura, the other one, I just said her name... She's pretty normal, so, yeah, I don't know, it's like, there's the, the extremes, but the extremes are pretty bad, like, there's girls that are just doing really horrible things to themselves, they're going mentally insane, which is too bad. I feel like I'm going insane right now, because my mind's just like, blah. Mm -hmm. I, so I was up in Montana, and uh, there was, like, no, were you still wearing peach dress up in Montana? No, when I was in Montana, then we would wear like long gap, like uh, gunny sack dresses, mm -hmm. and they would have like these giant square dances, and then in, in this like huge auditorium. And so I just remember being up there in the mountains with a whole bunch of people just all square dancing all around me, and I just think was thinking like, my mom will never find me here. <laughs> like I got to get out of here. Like this is really yeah. <laughs> like. Uh, I'm a little lost, or <laughs> like, I'm not fitting in, but, and especially like, you know, one of the older men decided it would be fun to show me how to square dance, so all I remember is just like, basically being like lifted up by this older man, and like swooshed around the floor, and it's like, it didn't even sound like a square dance, it sounded more like a, an auction, which it probably was an auction for girls, and it just told me it was a square dance. It's like, you know, get your girl, get your girl, you got some, step right up, step right up, but to the left, that one's yours, <laughs> you know, I don't know, like, I really don't know how it went, but like, that's what it seems like. Uh, I was causing problems though, because I did not like Jack, I didn't want to be around any of the older men at all, and I would start to get some real fascination with like the young boys that would play like down by the creek, like the river, and um, so I would go and so you could see what they were doing and you know the other girls would go with me so then after that I was sent home because the spirit told them that I was probably a better fit back in Ogden hmm. so don't question things and then, then after that then the other girls Helen's daughters and then Gail's daughter also came back to Utah so then we were in that group we were also in the FLDS for a while like the mainstream FLDS with Warren Jeffs he was on the FBI's Most Wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like it's. I don't think there's any real difference between one group and another group. Group because really, what my words are just like. Bleh. You're fine. You're doing fine. Because they all have like the same general purpose is mm -hmm. to get people to believe their way of thinking so that it can serve them, the men. And that's all there is to it, because it's the women that are out there doing all of the hard labor and including having all of these children there's no birth control allowed and oh let me tell you the difference between the Ogden group sexually and all of the other groups is that the Ogden group they taught that the women are supposed to interact and be with the other women they're supposed to have like lesbian relationships with the other women and satisfy each other because 
the prophet can't satisfy all those women and kids. I mean, he's busy landscaping. So, like, they would teach, like, okay, well, the women have to be together. Mm. So it's kind of like forced lesbianism or, yeah. Mm -hmm. like, so it's, I guess it's like sexual abuse to a child it, from a female, you would never think that, think of that as like being horrible, but I think that that is al almost even worse than a man because mm. a man I was always had a kind of like a little defensive anyway because I have, you know, just a masculine energy is stronger mostly in a masculine strong way, so I always am on guard, but when it's a woman that's soft and kind and loving and sweet to you and then they pull you into this insanity little bit by little bit and you, before you even notice you're doing all of the same things that they're doing because you're supposed to like I remember there they would teach me like here's the workbook you're supposed to learn this and I would flip through the notebook and read the lessons and know it goes like this and look at that over here isn't that wonderful and then I would look later in the schedule and it would say okay Amber teaches um, Elizabeth um, about panties or you know like how to sew them how to how why are they so sexy the history of them blah 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 whatever so yeah it's just hmm. now did the prophet in ogden did the pro what was his name arvin arvin did he enjoy the lingerie shows and oh, everything yeah yeah the prophet loved the lingerie shows because they were exactly i mean they were perfect for him and the thing that's really gross and sad to me too, though, is that his his long term wife was also part of the shows, and so we had like a little like sixty or seventy year old little woman that would dress up in the lingerie too. And I remember like she would come out, we'd be like woo, you know, and then like I would walk out, and then you get like oh that's so sexy, <laughs> you know, and you're like the sexy kid and you get all proud and you're getting like validation from that and then from nothing else like nobody was like oh you're doing such a good job with the peaches you know they're like no you are you are so good at dancing and you're sexy and I bet if you were in the real world you probably would have been on Broadway and of course my mind goes well I'm out of here because I'm going to Broadway <laughs> of course I never even tried but it's still it was the thought Right, that, you know, I was doing, like, these big grand shows, like, I remember, too, being up in, when I went up in Montana, just jumping around, just to peg and go back to Montana for a second, is listening to the Rocky Four soundtrack over and over and over and over again, because I had the, like, the cassette tape, mm -hmm. and I would, like, sneak it over and over and over, like, and I would look outside, and it was, like, really, really snowy in the mountains, and I'm like, I'm going to make an escape, just like, you know, with Rocky dumped and really, like, listen to the music, and I'd be like, okay. And I'd have this long gunny sack dress on and my, my boots on and I'd just get as far as like the bottom of the hill before I was like, it is so cold, I, where do I go? Like, I'm at the top of the mountain. And then once I'm at the bottom of the mountain, then what am I going to do? Then I'm just like, hi, I'm one of the polygamists with the goats up the hill. <laughs> you know, can you help? No? Okay, cool. You know, it's like, I try to like suppress down and squash any of the weirdness and just try to be like, Okay, so if something bad is going to happen, or if something is weird, weird is going to happen, or if it's something I don't believe in is going to happen, just just deal and just get over, get through it. And that's how I, I would do things instead of being like resistant in any kind of a way, of any, of any you know, in, in any way at all. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would do is just go along with it. Like, oh, you want me to do this? Okay. And then I just didn't do that good of a job. And I learned there very quickly, like, if I could not do a good job, then they can say, like, oh, well, maybe God wants you to be doing something else. So, like, another thing we would have to do is meditate, which I hated so much because they would send us into a room where, and then we'd have to go in there with our scriptures, which is, like, made, like, this Book of Mormon and, like, all these different books, and read and get a message on with a pen and paper from this, like, ghost spirit. So I would go in the room and I would sit there like with this pen and paper like okay, I don't hear anything. Like I had a thought, maybe I should wear something about flowers. I was thinking flowers. Maybe I'm thinking about flowers. Maybe the spirit wants me to think about flowers. And then I would just like write down something and then I would take it out and be like, look, okay, so this is what the spirit said. And then they would look at it like, mm, I, think, I don't 
don't know, I think his spirit wants to tell you something different. And then I realized I needed to just write down what I thought they wanted to hear. The spirit said I need to get more active with helping with the children. Oh, that's exactly right. You're so good at, like, you know, getting through to the other side and seeing past the veil. And, you know, you really have a knack for this, Amber. You're really, really good at having the spirit. <laughs> you know? I'd be like, thank you. I'm just really close with the people on the other side. <laughs> they really, you know, I have all these spirits around me all the time. You don't see them? <laughs> oh okay, so give me the answers I want. And that worked. And I had like a belief that, every, that there were things that they were saying could possibly be real in the back of my mind because of how convinced they were. Mm -hmm. But because I wasn't born and raised in the cult and that I'd have to, it's even a few years before we joined, you know, out in the world, I still wasn't a mainstream kid. We were still like those wild, you know, ragamuffins running around with tangled hair trying to sell watches, you know, with no school and no shoes. But I wasn't completely indoctrinated, uh, is that the word? Indoctrinated mm -hmm. into the beliefs of that this is the only way. And I always thought, well, I'm going to go out to the world for a little while, I'll have to let these people know somehow that the, I'm forced to go out to the world and then I'm going to be able to, I'm going to get a tattoo because they can't take that away from me. I thought, oh, if I get a tattoo, they can't take that away from me while I'm out in the world. And then um, after I go out and I have a whole bunch of fun, like have sex with real guys with six packs, <laughs> like things like that, you know, then I would be back. I just needed to go out and just have a little fun first before I settled in for the rest of the, my life. I mean, I wasn't even 18. I was like a kid. You know, I wanted to have fun. And it was also my first time being away from my strict parents. You would think that I would have less fun being in a cult than I would with my parents, but I was having more fun being in the cult. I still felt like I had more freedom in a very strict fundamental cult than I did with my parents. But that's just because of their frustrations were so over the top and extreme that they were they they would take their frustrations out on on all of us. So my dad started arguing with the cult leader and asking questions that they couldn't find the answers to. And my, my dad would think something seemed a little bit off. Like if he wanted to see his daughters, us, they would have to make arrangements, put it in a schedule and all of that. And it's like we're like five houses away. So he was starting to get angry and irritated because he's a very controlling man. And all of a sudden that we're in this group and yes, we're being fed for a while now. He's getting spoiled and like, okay, what's going, you know. I want my children with me. Mm -hmm. And how that, many wives was he allowed? He wasn't allowed any yet because he was not faithful enough. Mm. You have to have a certain level of priesthood, and my dad just could never get it. Um, there were times when he thought maybe he would, you know, take take on another wife, but the truth is he couldn't even take care of the one he had, and his, you know, three children, and. At the time, I didn't know it, but he had another child he'd abandoned and left behind in Texas. So, you know, I, I, everything is so confusing, and I think that's the most frustrating part for me, is because when you, I lived a life and I was told, this is the only way, this is the only way, this is the only way, well, you just, this is the only way, that way is wrong. That way is evil, you'll go to hell if you do that, but this is no, the only way. No, wait, 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 that's the only way. Forget this and this, now that's the only way. This is the truth. So I'm just sitting there like, okay, I'm going to do this, you know, like, what am I supposed to believe in? Because at first I had, like, this, this straight faith, like, there's God, He loves me, you know, sometimes things are hard, I'll get through it, He hears my prayers, He's going to make them, call, my dreams come true. End of story. I just have to wait and get out of here. You know, that was my, my thing. And, I don't know. I'll just go back to like I, I know I'm like spinning all the way back around. Amber, to, it's fine. Okay, no, but like it's fine. going back to when he was, my dad was arguing with Arvin. He would they set an alarm system where they would click a button. All the alarms would go off, kind of like doorbells in all of the homes, and they were going to tell my dad he had to leave. And they went and had a meeting with him, and he came out into the street. And he's like yelling, like I want my kids. Where's my children? I'm not leaving here without them. And the alarms went off and all the men came running out to the street and they were surrounding us with guns 
and everything like no and I'm like I'm staying I'm not going and you know Arvin was like yeah she's she's staying I mean I was special <laughs> I wasn't special at all <laughs> it was just a girl um, but so I don't know I think my parents were so frustrated and tired of all of my running away all of my rebellion all of my arguing against anything they had to say they were like she wants to stay she, if she even if they took me I would have run away and mm -hmm. gone back so they're like they took off and they left me there and they took my younger sisters and so I was left behind there in the group and after my parents left I just was like kind of feeling really just lost in the world like you know I I had all of these ideas of things that I felt um, built inside of my soul. Like I had this real need to like perform or to dance or to paint or you know just like very to, to be an artist. And that was like really just like squashed down. And so I would really want to just kind of like run away just to be able to express myself. And even the little things like I wanted to wear normal clothes. And I remember like going to Walmart or was it Target, one of those places, like a big store, uh, I don't know the name of it, but we would go in there and I would like look and be like, I want to dress like them. And someday I'm going to dress like a Walmart shopper. Ah! You know, that was big goals. Because <laughs> I was so over, you know, wearing what I was wearing. I, I had a, a less of a hard time than some of the other girls in the cult with the weight thing because I was already underweight from my parents not feeding me so I didn't have to like go through the things like where if the girls were, were you know even a pound overweight they would have to like not eat the next day and really kind of like there's some real sickness going on with girls getting sick and try, trying to force themselves to throw up in order to make weight and stuff like that you know like boxers I gotta make weight was that true for all the women mm -hmm. all ages yes Oh, what I was going to say when I was talking about Arvin's wife doing the show, his daughter also did the show with us, and he was having a sexual relationship with his daughter as well. So he was having a relationship with his wife and his daughter, which is insanity, but in my mind as a young child, my thought was, well, if his wife and daughter could trust him, you know, I mean, if his own daughter wants to have sex with him, it must not be that bad, right? So just not... Don't worry about it. Just keep keep going. And at what age did you start having sex with him, and were you married to him or sealed to him or whatever? It's yeah. Like? Well. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember uh, being. It wasn't a ceiling, but it was like a, it was like a announcement that I was chosen, and it was my time to go and um, be with Arvin and have sex with him. And how we prayed over, me and the women, we prayed over which lingerie I would wear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of funny because I wore peach. <laughs> Obviously. Wait, so tell that story again as soon as the siren goes. Oh, wait, I'm gonna stop this one. We'll... When it was announced that it was yeah. your time. Uh, what did I say? Like when it was announced that it was your time to go and Oh yeah, okay, so when it was announced that it was my time to go and to, you know, have sex with Arvin, it was like, the women, they were so excited, they kind of like were pumping you up, like you're going into this big, grand, like, you know, um, privilege, you're so lucky, the Prophet's chosen you, and, you know, you get to choose your own lingerie, and, you know, so, like I said, I, I chose Peach. <laughs> Every, everything was peach. I, I, I never wear peach now. Like, there's nothing peach in my closet. What is it? Wait, why did I have to wear peach and canned peaches? What is it with the peach thing? And give away the peach. Like, it's all about the peach, right? Should have been in Georgia. So where am I? <laughs> <laughs> so it was announced that tonight's the night. How old were you? Okay. I was 12, and it was announced that tonight... Or the night was okay. I was twelve when they told me it was my turn to be with Arvin. 
So I lived in a house across the street from him, and so with the women, we would get ready, and you know, I had them helping me with my makeup and my hair and the perfume and the lotion and the peach lingerie, and everything was like perfect, and then I put on a little coat, and like I was gonna get to um, do a little dance with a tape recorder with a song. So I was excited. Like, I get to listen to a song. Um, of course it was a, a hymn, reverent music, which there's something about like church hymns that make you not in the mood for sex, besides the fact that you're being raped and you're only 12. It can also be a mood killer. Like, it was just kind of like all like a head trip because I'm used to hearing certain kinds of music in a very reverent way, not mixed in that way. But I did get the opportunity to dance. So I went across the street and I remember like his wife answering the door and I went to the living room and they asked if I would like some tea and I said sure and they said oh well Arvin's downstairs have fun spinky spinky like it's like it's like some big great thing and I'm like you know like <laughs> okay <laughs> you know and I had been um, taken aside by uh, one of Helen's daughters and she said there's really nothing to worry about. He has like such a small dick that you, you won't even feel it. Even if you're a virgin, it's going to be fine. It's no big deal. And that was comforting because it turned out to be true. So it wasn't, kind, it wasn't a horrific sort of a, a thing. It was like a quick and easy like... I just went in, I completely like zoned out, stared at the lace curtains, and then he fell asleep. The worst part of being raped by him was actually having to lay there for the entire night to sleep beside him. Like, I wanted to get up immediately and just bolt. But it was my privilege that I got to spend the night with the prophet of God. And I just kept laying there like, God, why can't you make him like good looking? And I remember I asked him that because I was young and naive. I'm 12 and I'm like, so why are you good looking here on earth then? I don't understand. And he said, well, it's a test to see how loyal and how faithful you are on earth. And he's like, it's so cute, Amber, because you did the same thing when you were in heaven. Actually, he called me Serafina, not Amber. And nobody else called me that, but he called me a different name. Maybe he didn't even know who I was. <laughs> who knows? Like, maybe he thought maybe there was another girl, Seraphine, and I just thought it was my heavenly did he think, name. Did he think he knew you before in heaven? Yeah. Oh, he, he said that in heaven we all knew each other and that we were all chosen to be together here on earth and that we were chosen that we would all find each other. And then I would be tested because I would want a young, cute boyfriend and instead I would have an old man that's fat and bald and talks kind of like a prophet <laughs> a fake prophet you know like talks about like prayers and lingerie prayers and lingerie <sighs> okay so you had sold some of the lingerie to uh some strippers yes and um and you had gotten along with them you liked them they were from the outside world they had other music yeah. they had other clothes so you really like they were the Big strippers, time for you, right? Yeah. The strippers were amazing. I loved like doing shows for the strippers. They would come and it's like sit on the couch and you know, in the living room with you know like picture picture of like Jesus on the wall, which didn't really go with the lingerie. But they didn't let me do the set dressing. I would have made it completely like cool, like you know, staying alive or something, or Dirty Dancing, since that was the only movie I saw. <laughs> It's all going to be dirty dancing everywhere we go. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, I couldn't even listen to the music from Dirty Dancing because it was so evil from the world. Carnal. I, I keep losing my thoughts. Where was it's I? It's okay. It's okay. So, um. The shows. You, no. So, so let's move along to the, uh, to the strippers. Okay. And, um, how, what, how did it come the SAT? How did that whole situation happen? Oh, well, that was later on here in, in California. So. Oh, okay, never mind. Let's go back then. So, um, when you... So, after a while, I mean, you turned like 17 or whatever, and you were like, yeah, I kind of had it with the cult, right? Yeah. And I went into 
So repeat that again. Yeah. So after a, a while in the cult, I was really just ready to just, I wanted to be normal. I wanted to go to public school. I wanted to be part of the outside world. I looked around me when I was out in public and stuff, and I wanted to be a part of everything else that was going on. It was really important to me, and I wanted to find my real mother, so I felt very off the grid, isolated, and forgotten, and I was making plans to run away, but I didn't know where to go or what to do, so, and I also knew that if I were to leave on my own, that the prophet and the women and everyone would think, like, she left, so she can't come back because she's turned away from us. That makes me an apostate, which means that I learned the truth and turned away from it, which is worse than never learning the truth. So I had to make it somebody else's fault. So I snuck into Arvin's house across the street because theirs was the only one that had a phone book. And I looked up social services and I called social services and I remember talking so fast because I called on the phone. And I would have barely like 15 minute breaks in between each little thing on the schedule, like, um, you know, quilting party at the corner house at four and I'd have like 15 minutes to get there. So I went to the house across the street, I made the call to social services and I'm like, hi, this is Amber. I'm living here in this group and there, you know, I, I don't know where my parents are, but I think they're in some other state, but you know, I'm not really liking it here so much and I was hoping that you guys could come tell them I need to go to public school or, you know, just, and then I just kept going on and on and on because they were experienced and knew how to open me up and I just started to spill everything. Um, well, almost everything. I didn't tell them the truth about a lot of stuff, I still hid that, but I, so I was like, okay, I called social services, they're going to come and rescue me and get me out of here, and then it'll be their fault, and then I can, when I get older, I can come back. That was my plan. Like, I never really wanted to be, like, taken away, but then what happened is the FBI came in and raided the place, so everybody got taken away. Um, social services came in, and they took uh, all of the children, and uh, like about 8 to 12 of the adults were arrested for, you know, crimes against children and yeah, it was, it, it's a mind trip to be a part of because of how it starts with like one little weird thing that you're like, oh, that's kind of weird. But then if you believe that, then you can believe the next weird thing. And then before you know it, you start telling the weird things to somebody else and they're like, wait, what? Like another example of that is, I was told that these two young girls, one was, I won't say their names, okay, so there were two young girls, one was like about seven and then one was probably like 10. And I was told, these girls were your older sisters in heaven before you came to earth. And you said that when you came to earth that you would switch ages and they're twins and then that you guys would all be connected here. So you guys have a special connection. And that was like, why I would have to go and babysit them. You know, like just weird things like that. And you're like, oh, or you can't swim on Sunday because that's, you know, the Lord's day and the devil has more control of the water than he does the air. So if you're in the water, you could drown. Be safe, don't swim. Or, uh, you know, like the rules kind of just like came and went like, hey, what's my new rule I want today? I'm gonna pray about it, be right back. Oh, good. God said we could all have orgy sex. Yay. Didn't want to, but they held a sword over me and said they would strike me dead if I didn't. Gotta do it. You know, God's work. It's, it's funny because it's, it is every once in a while that I'll think of like some little weird thing about it that I forget about, like the underground tunnels. Like there's gardening and we would have like these underground tunnels that would go, like you could like go and push a like button and something would lift and then the whole go underneath the rose bed and there's a whole garden like a whole other room down there um full of like firearms and assault rifles and bombs and everything that we needed for the end of the world like as far as they were concerned the big grand apocalypse like the world was ending at any minute it was like doomsday and that was the thing so we had to like prepare for it the biggest thing that they did that sucked the most too is I had this rag doll that was given to me by somebody who loves me. It was left on my porch with a note from somebody who loves you. And I love this rag doll so much that they took it away from me because they said, 
you love that rag doll more than you care about anything else. Because I would say, I'm not going to my lesson unless I go and pick up Christine and my doll from across the street. And I was too old to be playing with dolls, but I had a real connection to it. So if you have a connection to something that's like physical, like, oh, I love my camera, or oh, I love my watch or my bracelet, then that's something you need to get rid of because you have a carnal connection to it. And they would say to me, like, don't be carnal. So I would, when I would meet these strippers, for me, I would think of them as the most glamorous thing in the world because they were these women that came in with boobs like Dolly Parton. They were, you know, like glittery hair clips and, and you know, they accidentally cursed once in a while. One of them came in and smoked and they let her smoke in the living room while we're doing our show. I was like, this is so cool. It's like we're dancing in a bar, just like how my real mom does it. I'm like a real stripper. This is so great. You know, I was like, this is everything I ever wanted. You know, <laughs> I'm going to be a stripper. And it, it, it's like stripper training camp because I, they were training me to, to do that. So tell me about the picnic. <coughs> we got about three or four minutes. Okay. It was, <laughs> it was finally announced the world was going to end. They had a date. It was uh, going to end and everybody needed to gather at the park. Um, at a certain time. The women went out and they bought like all of the fancy tablecloths. They went to, uh, you know, the warehouse store and bought tons of food for all of the angels and for God and everybody for the end of the world because they were coming to Ogden. <laughs> and because it was going to be like the best party. After the world is destroyed, an apocalypse has like blown everybody to shreds all around us, we're going to have a little picnic at a festival and be risen up in a bubble up to heaven. It's going to be spectacular. So what they would do is like horrible, horrible things is they would, they got rid of all of the animals because the animals, they said, don't go to heaven. And everybody showed up at the park. So they like, killed all the animals or they let them go? Or they what? killed them all. They put them in a hole and they shot them all. It was horror. Like they did horror, horror things. Just things like just horrible, horrible things. But actually my dog Athena is from there. That's where she came from. I saved her from that. They were shooting the dogs like the day that we went out there and me and another filmmaker were looking for where it was because we got a tip and we were trying to figure out where they were doing it and there was Athena so I grabbed her like and kept her so saved her and then she was pregnant too. Like my dog came out of the cult pregnant. You can't even leave a cult unless you're pregnant. I guess it's the only way to get out of having sex is to be knocked up already. Mm. Right? Okay so the apocalypse, we're back at the picnic and Everybody's waiting, like, okay, so when is it going to happen? It's like, we're passing the time, we're passing the time, you know, okay, we've got, the world's supposed to end, the picnic is over, kids are getting hungry, watermelon, everybody's like, where, what's going on? So the prophet came back, and he's like, okay, I spoke with God, it seems that there's somebody amongst us that is, like, having some very, like, worldly thoughts, they're really evil, they are thinking about worldly things that aren't, aren't you know, part of this world, and because of that, the world's not going to end. So we're not going to get to go to heaven. So who, somebody is like, has ruined it for all of us. I was like, it was me, <laughs> you know, thinking evil thoughts. I mean, and then I go, well, well I did save the world. <laughs> You're welcome. Jimmy, questions for me? Um, just how how are we doing it? Like, what are we going to do? Where do is there anything like how do I So you want to tell me your name? Yeah. So another question is do I do it like a like this because I haven't No, so just talk to me. Okay, all right. Just talk to me. So my name is Amber Don Lee. My real name is Cannabis Amber Don Lee. Um, how did that happen? My real mom, she named me Cannabis. Um she liked it a lot. It was her favorite thing, so did she spell it correctly? You know, I, I don't even know. I I spell it. Yeah, I think it's spelled correctly. Like the C A N N A B I S is how I spell it. Okay. I hope that's the correct spelling. But you know, then again, she was drunk, so who knows how she spelled it. And another thing is, when I was born, she had a fake ID at the hospital mm -hmm. with me. So there was like some woman that had a kid that didn't even know it. You know, like she had stolen a driver's license from some woman and used it. At, at the at hospital, hospital. Yeah. So there's no. You know why? 
Because she was running from the Rainbow Children, is what I heard. Mm. What's which the Rainbow Children? Some kind of like a different like extreme cult. Weirdly enough, we like we have like a lot of the similar like side by side stories, mm -hmm. except for you know I didn't rob the bank and all of that stuff. Right. But our stories are very similar. She was kidnapped when she was a baby too. Oh. So yeah. Did she ever find her birth parents? Did I? Did she? Did she? She did. She found her birth parents and then uh, it was a little bit too late for her though because she lived a really hard life with so much trauma. Like her, her real dad kidnapped her when she was a baby, told her that her mother was dead and that she had killed her, uh, put her out for prostitution and stuff like that mm -hmm. to support them and they were on the run and... How old was she? She was from a, she, when she was a baby up until she no, was... No, prostitution. Oh, she was a prostitute she, when she was like 12, 13. Mm -hmm. And then she um, got really into drugs and she met her real family. Uh, later on, they'd been looking for her. So she met when they, she was about 18. And then they were like, hi, you know, and they were together like, do you want to go to college? And she's like, well, what? You know, like, who, you know, what's going on? Like right. she was just thrown into a completely different world and it, which had to be hard too because she has sisters so she was looking at her sisters thinking probably like I could have lived this life yeah so I, I feel really really kind of a real connection with my birth mother it was the thing that that I used like my entire life like I was always searching for her thinking she was gonna fill a void for me mm. for sure she was going to be the one that like filled that empty space and she was the one like when anything was happening wrong that i didn't like i would be like well at least you're not my real mom yeah. so when they would say things about her like she's a drug addict she was a, a stripper she's you know a liar and a thief and a manipulator but gosh she's so sexy i'd be like that's what i want to be when i grow up like a complete fuck up that's cute like, that's what I wanted to be, you know, like... <laughs> goals. Yes, goals. And you know what? I did it. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know how, but it was a lot of work. But I did it. No, she was, like, so... Um, Hold on one second. Let me come in a little tighter. Oh, uh, like, none of this stuff is even on there. My mom had such a hard life. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, it's funny because she gave... Hold on, hold on. Okay, cool. Uh, she, when I was born, she carried me cross-country um, from where I was born. And so just do me a favor and just start that again. And when I was born, my mom carried me. Okay. So when I was born, my mom, she carried me in a papoose on her back, which is, it's like one of those like Indian backpacks um, that are really cool, like with the fringe on them and stuff. And she carried me in that that cross country hitchhiking mm -hmm. and she got to dallas texas and downtown dallas there was a head shop called the abovo head shop where they would sell like um drug paraphernalia and things like that so she took me there how old was she how old was she mm -hmm. she was 18. okay she was 18 and i was was she on her own yes yeah she was completely on her own i have no idea who my real father was she never mentioned who it could be or anything like that um yeah, I never really like cared about who my real dad was. It was always about my mom, that maternal connection that was missing, I think. I think I probably had enough men around already telling me what to do that I didn't lack that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so yeah, she so, shows up at the head shop. So she shows up at the head shop and she, I mean, she really did basically trade me for a pipe. Um, and the jokes I always say, like she traded me for a pipe and a black light poster and, um, some stuff then I was always like you know but, but really what happened really she traded me she went in there and she started talking to the guy in there who is now my dad and was like listen I'm having some problems they're turning my heat off can you just watch cannabis for a little bit and there he was like let me call my wife uh Patsy who he called on the phone she wasn't there that day and she's like bring me that baby yes and she was like cool I'll be back in a few weeks and they're like okay and she left and I was there and she never came back. And then they saw- Did she leave her name? Uh, yeah, she left her name. It was uh, her first name, Beverly. Um, but then she had like a stripper name, which was Rose. Um, and then she, she took off 
and they just kept me and then they saw on the news that she had robbed a bank and so they decided not to tell anybody anything and just move with me to Utah since she was already in prison and not trying to claim me or anything so she didn't want so how did she get caught robbing the bank <laughs> that's the funniest part it's like she went and she robbed a bank and she looked so cute while she did it too this is like my favorite part she made front page news in the newspaper and she was wearing like a little tank top and little shorts i'm like you robbed a bank wearing a tank top how cute like you know it's just like a hardcore cool badass but and it was all her idea to rob the place she went to a bank took a gun up that she'd stolen from the back of a pickup truck, you know, when they would have like the guns in the back windows. She stole one of those, convinced her friend and her lesbian lover to go and rob a bank with her. She robbed the bank. Then they took off the wrong way down a one way street and got caught. And she was hiding in the trunk with her lesbian lover girlfriend. So were they stopped for driving the wrong way on a one way? She didn't even get caught robbing the bank. She got caught driving the wrong way on a one way. Straight and what did they do in the trunk, do you know? <laughs> they were hiding in the trunk because they, with the money to keep it safe. But how did the cops know to open the trunk? I have no idea. I think that once they pulled them over, they were like, wait a minute, something's going on here. And I don't know. Hmm. My mom was probably in the trunk just laughing and they heard her or something. I don't know. She was like probably like instigating it. Like, you can't hear us. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, like making out with her girlfriend. I don't know. She's just getting prepared for prison, probably. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, who knows? <laughs> she, yeah, she was also really charming. Like, my mom was so charming that she could get away with so many things. I mean, she didn't get away with bank robbery. But she did get away with, like, robbing several 7-Elevens before she robbed the bank. So she was practicing. Mm. Yeah, so she did have a bit of practice, which is good. Everybody needs practice if they're going to rob a bank, right? I would think so. Yeah. I do practice for a lot of things, it's good. <laughs> exactly. All right, so you're an infant. Yes. And you're with? So I'm with Ross and Pat, who are now my new parents. They didn't officially adopt me until I was about three years old, um, when finally they realized they needed to get some paperwork going and uh, stuff like that. So they moved with me to Utah because at the head shop, there was some Mormon missionaries that came in and they started giving my new parents like lessons. Um, so imagine like my, these, this old hippie couple, well they were younger, a young hippie couple like just sitting there smoking cigarettes and rock music playing and they're having like events at the head shop and stuff and there's Mormon missionaries. Like there couldn't be like a more extreme. So. And they, where was this, what state was this in? This was in Dallas, Texas. And so they, got baptized because they did a prayer to see if they could stop smoking. They stopped smoking cigarettes and decided to go straight. They went straight. They became Mormon, you know, like the mainstream, like I am a Mormon, kind of Mormon. And then they got the message from God after they prayed about it. Because now they learned that they could just pray about things instead of like figuring it out to get an answer, you know, so like, should we move to Utah? I think so, yeah. And so then they would move, they moved to Utah, which is the promised land. So like, when the world ends... Wait, wait, hold on a second. Back it up. So, how does that go? I pray about something, and I get an answer. Yeah. So, like, you can pray about something, and the way that you get an answer is if you have, like, a burning of the bosom, is what they say, or, like, that feeling is, like, the spirit. Or you could just have gas. <laughs> Either way, you know, like, or a tummy ache. It's the same kind of thing. And I think, yeah, it's like, this is the new philosophy is if somebody tells you to pray about something, don't. Just... Don't, don't pray. I mean, that's not the way to get answers. It's the same way to get answers, like if you shake like an eight ball and like look at the answer, like, oh, same kind of thing. But my parents were really uneducated and, and very ignorant. And I'm not saying it in a mean way. I'll say other mean things about them later. But like they're, they were just very ignorant. How much education had they had? They had up to high school education, but they didn't really know a whole lot about the world about how things worked they were always really curious about things around them but in really small ways they thought very small their thinking was very small it was like right what's present right here in front of us and they were very poor so we lived in extreme poverty and we would like dig in were the there any other kids yeah they had two other children um i had two younger sisters 
and uh, so we were all raised together um, in a really confined space most of the time. Like we lived in like a storage unit or we would live in the car, we would live in a tent in the mountains. Sometimes we would rent a house for like a month or two until they kicked us out. Um, but we were always like really, I remember being really hungry as a kid. I was underweight and it was a struggle. My dad and my mom would argue a lot. They, they were very stressed about not having money. And in the, at the same time, they were just trying to find like their life purpose, like, you know, God and this and that. So we went to like mainstream Mormon church. And I remember being a kid that had so much like undeniable faith. There's nothing that could waver me. I was like, this is the true church. They're telling me that I'm singing in primary. Everything is normal. And then everything just kind of like stopped because they started hanging out with this woman named Helen. And honestly, I love Helen. So let's pause for a sec. I just want to, um, parents have just joined the church and moved to Utah. Um, tell me how that was different. Just being a Mormon, um, just, were you still living in tents? Were you still living in a storage yeah. unit or had things sort of settled down for you? Um, we were still living in extreme poverty. The church did help us out quite a bit. They always would step in and they would do things for us. Like they would um, bring us a Christmas tree or, you know, I remember that as a kid, them bringing us a Christmas tree and my dad being so full of pride that he didn't want to let us have it. And Where were you when you got the tree? We were renting a house at that time. There was the times when we lived homeless between places. It was always like such a struggle to have any kind of money there was never it was it was always like what are we going to do for money and i would start doing things myself to try to help the family and my younger sisters would do it with me we would go door to door and start selling stuff ourselves um like hey do you want to buy a watch or hey do you want to buy a fuller brush cleaning products or we would have like we Where sold you get the watch my dad would buy like a bunch of them at the swap meet and then we would go and try to resell them in these little Velcro things. It was kind of like, hey, want to buy a watch? And then when you open it, it's like all these velcro watches. These kids at your door with a bunch of watches. Imagine. How old were you? I was probably like, you know, eight. <laughs> I was just like, hey, with my younger little scraggly sisters. We didn't brush our hair. We wore the same clothes every day. We were just like those kids, <laughs> you know, like um, selling everything. We sold ceramics on corners, which were like ceramics yard statues that we got from Mexico because my dad also did odd jobs. He was a, um, what are they called, coyote? He was a coyote, so he would bring over like truckloads of illegal immigrants. Um, and if we were renting a house and stuff, they would all come and live with us for a little bit. So it was like always, I was always in homes that was where there was like not just us as a family too, it was like just tons of people everywhere. Um, and yeah, so we would have ceramics and we'd sell those on the street. We sold fake Cabbage Patch Kids with fake birth certificates. And like, yeah, I was wondering like, did I get my fake birth certificate? Like, you know, from a Cabbage Patch Kid box? That would be weird. <laughs> I bet I did. Um, okay, so then they meet, what's her name? Helen, yeah. And then they meet Helen. I liked Helen so much because my parents were very, they believed in, um, they were abusive. Like, I, it's like, I don't want to like, I, I feel like I'm selling them down the river and I, or is that the word selling them down the river? You don't sell to a river. Sailing? Whatever it is. Pushing them down the river. There we go. I feel like I'm selling them out. That's what it is when I'm telling that they're, they were abusive, but they were very abusive because they didn't know how to control or handle emotions at all. And that's how I was raised. Like if I have an, had an emotion, you know, that's what I'm feeling. Everybody feel it. And you know, that's not how the world really works. Um, I learned that later when I would show up everywhere with like, Hey, I got lots of emotions. Anybody want to hear about it? And they're like, no, we don't go away. Um, yeah. So, we, we went to regular elementary school, me and my younger sisters. Everything was really pretty normal. I was having violin lessons. I did some art lessons and I loved school because I had friends. And of course, I wasn't allowed to hang out with any friends that weren't Mormon, of course. But I had some friends. And then we started hanging out with Helen and Helen had kids my age too. So her, her daughters were the ages of me and my sisters. 
So we would all play together at these little home seminars that they would have where it's like they would have like these slideshows. It was like putting up slides that shows you exactly the truth of God, like on a broken projector, you know, like this is where all of Zion is taking place. God wanted this to happen in this little tiny house in Utah. Imagine like, no, it's not the chosen place, but my parents believed it. They believed that Helen was telling the truth when she was talking about polygamy and the extreme beliefs that the Mormon religion used to believe until taxes and all that came up and mucked the whole thing up. And they had what to was that? History. When did that happen? Well, uh, let's see, the church started in the 1800s and then they, they, along the way, they started letting things change with time. Like first, you, there were no blacks allowed to have the priesthood, then they let the black, black people in, and then they didn't let, uh, the men are always like the head of the household and the women are beneath them. It's like a lot of very old beliefs. And then polygamy, if you have three wives or more, If you have three wives or more, then you can make it to the top level of heaven because there's three levels of heaven, like celestial kingdom, telestial kingdom, and trilestial. So like VIP or like medium, you're okay, or like, eh, it's better than hell kind of place. Um, they started teaching slideshows and, and my parents decided to join the group because what was happening is Helen was moving into a new group. She was buying a new house where there was like a set of probably like 12 to 15 homes all together in an enclave and everybody in those homes were practicing this way of life, otherwise known as a cult. So they were, they were building and it's a break off cult from there's like the mainstream Mormons and then there's the fundamental Latter-day Saints, FLDS, and then it breaks off into these little subgroups. Like there's one in Manti with a fake prophet. There's one in Ogden with a fake prophet. And they just keep going. So we were a break off of that. So we followed Helen to this new place. And it was amazing because at this place they had food. Lots of food. It was kind of like I felt like this really is heaven. Because every single thing seemed like really perfect on the outside. Like the homes were all really beautiful. They had like amazing gardens because the prophet was also a landscaper on the side um yeah uh so he would make these amazing immaculate like gardens and landscaping so we just looked like we were really really great except for that we were a cult um we had to look perfect every single day like our hair had to be done dress and everything was chosen for us but what they did when we first showed up is they separated me from my parents. I want to say that too. So my parents were not sitting there looking and watching everything that they were teaching me. They were learning their own things at Helen's house, but they had sent me down the street where the young girls went, uh, Helen's girls went, and I went to the prophet's house. Because we were special. How old were you? Um, when I got there, I was like uh, about 12. Yeah, about 12. Um, and how many, 11, 10, 11, 12. So there were how many girls, what ages, living in the house with the prophet? Okay. There were girls living at um, all ages with the prophet from three years old on up. And the three-year-olds were part of what he called the sister council, which means that they were chosen to be his brides. They just weren't um, grown up enough. You know, they had to at least be like 11. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know. So... He, you know, we all lived together and I was actually really excited when I found out like that the prophet wanted me to be one of his wives because he was known for having like the prettiest wives and I wanted to be chosen as one of the prettiest and if I was going to be, you know, like a sister wife, I wanted to be one to the prophet like, hey, he's the guy at the top. I'm marrying good. I mean, when he dies, he is no longer going to be like a big fat bald man with, bald. yeah, he was, he was well, I'll show a picture of what he looks like. <laughs> and then you can see, but, but in heaven, he would say that he was like really hot. He's like, in heaven, I'm a warrior for God. I carry my sword and I have a cape and I have a six pack. Like he looks like, I'm, I, I don't know why he would wear a sword and a cape in heaven. And he's like, and I, I'll always be 20 years old. And I remember asking him like, why are you 21? So you can at least buy beer in heaven. And he's like, well, in heaven, you don't have to ha use an ID. I was like, he's so smart. So he was planning on drinking in heaven. Yeah. Even though on earth, that's not part of the belief. 
Well, he you could probably you could drink. He would let you could drink in the cults, just not in the mainstream. Oh. Yeah, and you could have coffee in the cults too, which is very evil, but we did it. Um what else was considered evil? Um well, we the outside world was a place that was so they called anybody that wasn't us the outside world. And we were not allowed to talk to people in the outside world because they were all against us. And anywhere we went, like even to a grocery store or anything, there always had to be three of us for women together. Not two, because two could talk each other into something. But if there's a third, then you, know, you, you will stay behaved, I guess. Which I always was getting into trouble. I would go to the grocery store, you know, and I'd like turn on the radio a little bit and get in a big argument. I remember turning on the radio and there was that song like in the car. Yeah, and I was like that song. Ooh, baby, do you know what it's worth? I can't sing. <laughs> Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. And they're like, turn off this devil music. And I'm like, how can it be devil music if it's talking about heaven on earth and that's what we're creating? It's a good song and I really wanted to rock it, but no. They decided no, because they didn't really. It's like the women always would go to the men and, can we do this? You know, and like they would do all of the thinking for the women, which is, you know, a nice relief if you don't feel like thinking for yourself. You just like, hey, what do I do now? Okay, that, okay. And it's really kind of, um, I guess it's like the same way it is in pres prison. You just become used to it. Like, oh, you're supposed to do this, and you're supposed to do this. And I had a schedule made for me every single day. And What kind of things were in your schedule? I would go uh, garden in the morning. I would do you know gardening, and then I would go to like the fabric store with these two other people. And then I would come back where I would have to fix the little girl's hair, which was um, our younger sisters in the sister council. And their hair, their, har, their hair had to be like completely perfect. And... Um, in case, you know, Jesus wanted to show up, we needed to always look our best. And the house had to be completely clean and perfect in case Jesus wanted to show up. Um, because it had to be like the perfect house of God. And you know, if you think about it, like God, the almighty God, if there is a God, would he want to go to like a little small house in an enclave, like subdivision in Ogden, Utah as his place of, in all of the world to like be at the end of the world? Yeah. That is not what's happening. So, yeah, there were a lot of, you know, it was pretty strict there, but I was really happy because I got to spend time with my friends, other people my age. I didn't have to listen to my parents. I was always very rebellious against my parents from the very beginning. I didn't, um, I didn't let them just say something and that be the way it is. I always questioned everything and I would argue against everything I was never the type to just oh we're gonna do this well okay but why just like I asked you before we're doing this okay like, what are we doing again even though I know like just to, I don't know I would but then I would argue back I don't I was really just a young girl who was confused and didn't know what I was doing I was just there flopping around really um, we would have family home evenings so we would study scriptures we didn't study anything like uh, math or science or anything like that because I'd been taken out of school in the third grade because my parents didn't want me to learn like evil things like about the world, you know, or like to learn that they're psycho. Uh, it was, and they were abusive too. I think they wanted to keep me out of school also so that they could get away with more, you know, and I wouldn't go to school and be like, hey, guess what they did, <laughs> you know, because I was always trying to get out always trying to run away, always trying to, I always caused problems from the very, very beginning. And I always wanted to like meet my real mom. And that was also something that was really important to me. So I never had the idea of just completely uh, submitting to any one way because I had my own plans for what I wanted to do with my life from the very beginning. And it was fine. My mom, she's going to save me. Everything's going to be amazing. And that's the end. You know, so. so now, when you were living there, what um, connections did you have to the outside world? I mean, you saw people, but were there any movies? Did you have internet? Did you have a cell phone? Was there any of that stuff? No, we didn't have... I was allowed to watch um, only two movies. We weren't allowed to watch TV. 
cell phone, anything like that. But the two movies I was allowed to watch is I could watch Dirty Dancing and um, Summer Lovers. Summer Lovers is with Daryl Hannah where she goes on a vacation um, and they meet a third girl and then they are all three lovers and live happily ever after. So a guy into women. Yeah. And then the prophet said, who, by the way, his name is Arvin. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, it's sexy, Arvin. <laughs> I can't even like pretend like so <laughs> where was I? <laughs> and then uh, Dirty Dancing why would, yeah, why would Dirty Dancing watch that one? they explain uh, Arvin explained to us like if the movie had been made in heaven which it wasn't it, they would have had it where the dancer who had the abortion in the beginning uh, she would have been like part of them because there's that scene of them all three dancing together and that's how it's really supposed to be in heaven that they really all loved each other why did they have to get rid of the girl who had the abortion from the other guy she loves him too and shouldn't they all be together so we were allowed to watch that uh -huh. yeah and then as far as like talking to other people from the outside world absolutely had no contact with them except we would have shows for the local strippers because all of the um, children and the women, we learned how to sew lingerie that we would sell to the local strippers. Also, Oops. <laughs> say that again because I broke the camera. Okay, we would we would sell lingerie to the local strippers. We would sew it ourselves and make these cute little outfits, like with different themes, like a, here's a cowboy lingerie outfit, and it was really a fun way to be creative and weird. I mean, what kids are like walking around like modeling lingerie for strippers? It's so bizarre that. Wait, 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 wait. wait. So, like, how did this even begin? Okay, um, I was like called in to the bedroom once uh, by Sherry, and she. Whose bedroom? Um, well, there was no specific anybody's bedrooms. Everybody would share all of the places depending on where they were assigned to sleep that night. So Sharon, who was in charge of like the women and their sexual way of life, they called the SWOL, the SWOL, um, she was in charge. And so she told me like, you know, we're going to trust you to something really important. You are going to help us to bring in more people who are really needing to find the truth. And they're coming here and they're single and they're strippers. And, you know, we're going to, you know, sell them some lingerie and then we could probably, you know, talk them into staying and just be really sweet to them. And I was like, great. So I would start making up these routines to teach the other, like, women, like, you know, we're going to do this routine for the strippers and, like, put on, like, little shows. And I had it all choreographed perfectly and I would get in arguments with the women, like, I don't want to dance to, like, you know, organ hymns. It's not sexy. And I mean, I was 12. I was a sexy kid. <laughs> so, like, had you had sex already by that time? No. I had no sexual anything, but I had, um, I had always known that I had had some sort of a, I, I called it, I'm calling it sexuality for myself, but it's not. I don't know what it is, but it's like I always knew that it was going to be like a big part of my life, the sexual part, and I don't know why. Um, just being sexualized so young, I also craved the sexuality part because I thought my real mom was like that. So, and I would be in dramatic situations. Like even, you know, when it came to like, I don't know, when I was raped, I would think, is this how my mom felt when she was like out in the world and doing stuff? I wonder if she felt like this bad feeling or did she feel this and I would go through my own emotions and wondering trying to compare it to like hers like mm. is this you know I I didn't really know what to do with them and also remember I was completely uneducated I didn't know anything from the third grade all the way up until high school there's that huge educational gap I mean everybody else is learning things like math and science and and those things and I'm learning how to be a good um, wife and mother and seductress so I was basically in stripper training camp, you know, like they, that's what it was. So we would have the shows. I would put on the, um, so how many people would be in the show and where would you do it? And we would just do the shows in the living room and there would only be like one girl to come just at a time, or, you know, and she would, this dancer would come, oh, hi, hi, nervous. She'd sit down on the couch and probably was thinking, what is going on? How did I get into this? 
I didn't know that. I was behind the couch hiding, ready for my part. <laughs> I'm so excited about this routine. It's gonna go fantastic. And I would go out there and I would do my show and I was so excited and I would be like, this person from the outside world, she's wearing jeans. You know, I'd be like, that's so cool. Cause we were all dressed in dresses every day. Um, and it just seemed like she was free to wear whatever she wanted. You know, we got to choose um, nothing for our clothing or makeup or hair. When we first arrived, they did like a color wheel, like God wants you to wear, and they'd move the color wheel to my face. God wants you to wear, and they chose the color for me, peach. I was like, I don't think God wants me to wear peach. I think he wants me to wear like red. They're like, no, the devil wears red. Peach is your color. So I, everything I had, all the way down to my panties and everything was all peach. Peach everything. So they knew like that's what I was allowed to wear, and I always wanted to change different colors, but no, I wasn't allowed to, so but the lingerie was a way to really express myself. So even though I was like out there dancing in like lingerie as a child for an adult, in my mind, I was on like a big Broadway show. It wasn't in a little small living room. I was doing the performance of a lifetime. This was just my outfit, sorry guys, you know, but it was like, I would have the, like the gloves and the little cowboy hat. And, I wanted to do the song like, I want to be a cowboy, yippee, yippee, yeah, yippee, yo, yo, yo. But that song is, of course, from the devil, too. So I didn't get to dance to it. I did later. I'm like, oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> like, <laughs> trying to keep that song away from me. <laughs> yeah. So were you guys able to um, convert any of the strippers that came? Well, by that point, I wasn't allowed to stay and talk. I had to, um, like, hi, nice to meet you, did our show, thank you. And they videotaped our show, which, by the way, made Good Morning America. You can see, like, the little strippers walking around in a circle. I was like, okay, we were cuter than it looks on the film. <laughs> so we would do that, and then I would have to leave, and then they would give the girl, the stripper, like, lessons and stuff. And I think, like, one or two girls did actually come and join. Um, one girl that came and joined had a kid with her and her ex-husband was completely against the group so that caused friction because he would come and like this take pictures and, and get things going and you know I was starting to get like really bored being there too I was like I have to get out in the world I don't have my parents anymore we got rid of them that's good even though they told me that when we all die I was sealed to them in a to my adopted parents so that when we all die in heaven, I would be with them. I was like, I don't want to be with you when I'm in heaven. If I'm going to heaven, it's because I did something right, not wrong. Less, you know, I love them very much. I'll say that, but they were whack jobs. Helen used to move in people. She would use move in families. And I know I'm going all like this, but that's okay. That's why there's editing. Yeah. So Helen would come and she would um, invite like families to live with her. So, Imagine her poor kids. They're like, actually, stop. So let's start. Yeah.